on bonus or step. Yeah. Because that's what sets us up for this, we've got to be the mom crap. Yeah, it's true. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related. Real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 220 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. What have you been doing? Me? Yeah. You always ask me what I've been doing, so what have you been doing? I don't know. You threw me for a loop. (laughs) I know. I've been working on nacho stuff. Good answer. Good answer. I know. (laughs) See, I try to work on nacho stuff, too. No, David. And then you're like, why don't you help me do dishes? I'm like, because that's not my stuff. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm not even going to go down this path with you today. (laughs) Because I kick into since when is it the woman's role to blah, 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 blah. Now, granted, it's not. Grant, it's not the woman's role. Hang on. It's your role. Oh. <laughs> I wish y'all could see her face right now. <laughs> She's got this how dare you look. <laughs> and this is why we don't do videos. <laughs> All right. Before we talk about our guest today, I want to talk briefly about the Nacho Kids Academy. We created the Nacho Kids Academy so we could truly help people learn to nacho properly, and to better their blend and lessen their stress while building better blended relationships. Mm -hmm. You can't learn that in the Facebook group, folks. Nope. You need to do the Nacho Kids Boot Camp Challenge, and you need to do the Change Your Stinking Thinking Challenge. And those are found only in the Nacho Kids Academy. All right. Okay. Where can I find such academy? At nachokidsacademy.com. Hmm, simple. Yes. And just briefly, there are over 20 video courses in the course library. There is a private community that nobody will know who you are. There are two Q&A coaching calls each month. And there are over 100 hours of previous Q&A coaching calls to listen to. Nice. Yep. And I'm forgetting something else. But it's all in there, folks. You don't need to go anywhere else. That will help you. So if you want help, go there. If you just want to vent, go to the Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying if you don't want help. Yeah, if you don't want help, go to the Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they can help a little bit, but it's going to take you a long time to sort out good advice versus bad advice. And... And it triggers people too. Yes. Because a lot of people who join the academy, they'll tell us the first thing I did was I stopped going into the Facebook group. Or sometimes they even say I stopped go- getting on Facebook at all. It's not just our group, it's like all the groups that are on there. Right. They say that they're they're triggered. Um, sometimes somebody what somebody else is going through makes them mad. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not even their problem, but it just triggers a lot of um, anxiety and pain and all kind of stuff. So, right. yeah. And if you're doing one of our challenges, you don't need to focus on a bunch of crap, a bunch of negativity. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't need to focus on that anyway. I get feeling like you aren't alone and that's great, but don't wallow in this mud hole of blended crap when you can get out. Yeah. You found out you're not alone. Now let's move forward. Yep. All right, so David, we're going to move forward. Let's do it. Our guest today is Allison. She is known for Be Step Wise. She has been blending for 28 years. 28 years. Goodness. Stepson, 37. Stepdaughter, 33. Our son, 24. Our son, 23. Man, she was blending before blending was cool. (laughs) It still ain't cool, David. It still ain't cool. (laughs) The hardest part of blending for her was her partner's ex was deceased. So the grandmother Mm. took over a mothering role. Yep. Hmm. Sound familiar, David Sims? 
Yeah, that can happen when the other person is not deceased. Yep. She <laughs> was a stepchild herself. Her mom passed away when she was 17. So eventually, Dad started dating. And he got remarried when Allison was 25. Hmm. I wonder how that went. Well, if you want to know, you got to listen, Linda. All right. I shall. Yes, it's a good one, y'all. It's a good one. All right. All right. All right, then. Let's get listening to it. Today, we have stepmom Allison. Hey, Allison, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. So tell us a little bit about your blend. First of all, I want to say you've been blending 28 years. Have I? (laughs) Well, you said since 1995, so if my math is correct, (laughs) 27, 28 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, my blending story really starts before that. Because I was a stepchild. Okay. Which is where my knowledge of uh, step parenting uh, definitely started. Well, let's talk about that. How old were you when you became a stepchild? Well, my mum died when I was 17. I'm so sorry. And I had uh, four younger brothers. And my dad, you know, it was, it was a very sudden thing. And so my father was left with five of us children. And uh, he was, he was kind of, I think later he told me that he got lonely. Mm -hmm. And now I understand that because I'll get on to why I understand that. But it's, um, but, uh, and he said, you know, you want company. And I can understand that because he had five children and he probably needed somebody else to help him with the children apart from anything else. And um, so he started dating And there were a number of women that he dated until he dated my stepmother. And eventually she was the one who won through Mm -hmm. (laughs) and he married her, but not until actually, to be truthful, I was 25. So I was a bit older then. Okay. But the point of it, I think, is that I I was the eldest of five children and I was the only girl. Right. So I, I had four younger brothers. And so I felt very maternal when my mother died because Mm -hmm. I was like my mother's little helper. So um, I used to do like things like cook supper and help my mum do everything. And then suddenly when she died, I just carried on doing that. But it made me very protective of my, particularly my youngest brothers when my mum died. And then it made it very difficult for me to watch a stepmother take over. Right. You know, I think that a stepmom isn't really, she's in the relationship or she's with the family because of the, um, because of her relationship with my father, not because she wants to become a mother to all of us. And so I think it's difficult for her. It was difficult for her to sort of come in. She was living in my mother's house, taking over quite a lot of what my mother did, but not really invested in it like my mother would have been. Mm-hmm. She, what she really wanted was a, a, a family of her own and my father as her husband. And I think that made it very, t- very tough for her. But the long and the short of it, it was, is that I learned, I think the thing I learned, Laurie, the most is that if only she could have just done a few things differently, the outcome would have been different. The way she went about getting things done, just pitted her against us like she'd sort of come in and take over or she wouldn't consult us very much. And she was, she had a tendency to be slightly critical. Well, slightly critical. She was, (laughs) she would, she would, you know, nothing was ever quite, you know, we were never good at, nothing ever pleased her. So, And I think that's not because we didn't please her. It was just that she wasn't invested in the relationship. Why should she? And therefore, everything was done slightly under sufferance. It's a bit like, oh, God, another meal for seven people now, you know. Mm -hmm. And, 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 And I just think that if only she had managed to do things differently, she would have had a very different outcome with us. And that's what I took forward into becoming a stepmother myself when I became one many years later was that to do the things differently from my stepmother Mm -hmm. that I had learned from her. I'd learned how not to do it 
And I was dead keen to try and do things to get a better outcome next time. Yes. So she came in like a drill sergeant, (laughs) tried to tighten up the ship, we'll say. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing that's very interesting, Laurie, is, 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 is that when there's a gap between the like the death of my mother, or it would be the same if it was a divorce, mm-hmm. there's a period in the middle there where the children rule the roost in a way, because mm-hmm. there's my dad, and you know, he's not even noticing what we're all doing, and we're going, hey, you are. <laughs> right. And then suddenly, you know, a new stepmother's on the scene, and suddenly she's doing things like buying us new clothes, you know, and, and sort of making sure that we're, you know, got the washing on and things. And this is new to all of us. <laughs> it's it, it's kind of like she can be, it was a bit like a drill. Well, it wasn't quite like a drill sergeant, but <laughs> she, but you know, she she had that job to do. And it's very easy for a stepmom. That's another thing to for a stepmom to come in and say, well, it's obvious that the this these children's diet needs to be improved and they need to take more exercise and they need to have less screen time and they need to do this, that, and the other. It's very easy to come in as a stepmother and find fault because things have sort of slipped <laughs> in the previous family, if you sort of mean. Right. Or it's not the way they would do it themselves. Yeah. Yeah, there's that as well. Or the there's way that. they think they would do it if it was their kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what year did your mom die? She died in 1974. Okay. I wanted to put that in perspective for our listeners because th- that was a different time. It was a very different time, yeah. And usually if a stepmom did come in the picture then, it was mostly because there was a death more so than a divorce. Divorce wasn't as prevalent we'll say, back then. Yes, true. So I remember in school, there were a few children that Mm. had parents that weren't together. Mm. They were few and far between. Yeah. And yes, they would go every other weekend to their other parent, their dad. Mm. Most of the time they live with their mom. And so with your mom passed away, it's that time frame Eight years later, when he marries your stepmom. Yeah. So we're in the 80s by this point. It's becoming a little more normal to have step families and things. I wonder, well, you said that she wasn't really invested, but she wanted a family of her own. Yeah. Did she ever have kids of her own? Yes, she did. I've got a half sister. Okay. So she only had one. Yeah, I think, you know, Laurie, that to say that she wasn't invested in us is probably a little bit unfair because I think that what she really wanted to do, she really wanted to succeed at it. Mm -hmm. And she really wanted us to, she wanted to be it to be a success and she wanted to make it a success for my father. And she did give it her best shot. She she really did try. I think that we were quite difficult because... That's a lot of youngins. There's a lot of youngins, but also we were breathed, breathing. Yes. And I think in my, if I were to say something about myself, I would say that I, I definitely hadn't finished or even begun, shall we say, the mm-hmm. grieving process. Because actually my father met her six months after my died. My mother died. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, it was quite, I mean, you know, it was quite, so, and that's quite common for, for men to repartner quite quickly after yes. death. But it took them eight years to get married. Well, I think it was because she was uncertain about oh. committing to this huge family yeah. when Things were tricky. But the point was that I think I blame myself as well, because I think I was nowhere close to recovering from the death of the sudden death Mm -hmm. of my mother when this new woman arrives on the scene. And I think processing grief is one of the things that step parents find it difficult to accommodate because 
they're not in that place at all when they meet a new person and they're happy building a new relationship. My, my stepmother loved my father. You know, they were from cloud nine. Mm-hmm. And I was just left behind and resenting it. Yeah. I was thinking, well, when has dad forgotten my mum? You know, what's going on here? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I think that we gave her a hard time. We gave her a hard time. Be- and also we were able to because we were like a group of kids that work together because we'd had this grief, this common loss. And so we were very close. We were thrown very close together. We were, we were like a gang, you know, <laughs> you know we'd, 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 we'd sort of. And so I think we made it quite difficult for her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I get the gang mentality because I don't know if you know our story, but David and I, between us, have five kids. Yes. All boys. He has four. Of those four is a set of triplets. And that's how I pictured them, like a little gang. It's actually really good sibling bonding. Yes. It's, mm-hmm. it's a source of real support for them, each other, that each other's sibling closeness. But, of course, you as the step-parent in the situation, it makes it more difficult, of course. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase mini-wife syndrome. Yeah. Tell me what that's about, because I'm not quite sure what mini wife syndrome sounds. Somebody else said that to me recently, and I didn't understand it. It's basically where the daughter takes on the household responsibilities Yeah. when the parents split and becomes yeah. basically the woman of the house. Right. And then when a stepmom comes in the picture... This child is considered to have mini wife syndrome because she's showing signs of stress, worrying about the relationship that she's going to have with her father now since stepmom's in the picture and how her role is going to change because she's been the one taking care of everything and she feels like she's being pushed out. Mm. Mm. I definitely think that because I think that what well, I I think I I also call it sort of like it's like parentification parentification because the yes child and the eldest daughter which I was but well, I was forced into that situation my mum had died and I had four younger brothers right I mean I'll tell you a joke I mean my I went I I went to a convent school and the uh, head nun you know the the uh, miss the headmistress of the school called me in. And to our office, and she said, well, now your mum's died. How many brothers did you say you've got? So I said, well, i got four. And she said, well, that means you're going to have five shirts to wash and five shirts to iron every day. Oh. That's what she said to me. Can you imagine that? (laughs) That's, um, I have a lot of different emotions (laughs) with that. And she didn't even talk to me about the emotions of losing my mum at that point. All she could think about was me having to wash the five shirts. Yeah. It was 1974. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was telling you what you were going to have to do. I didn't do it. You didn't? Good. That's what I'm sitting here thinking. Oh, gosh, did you have to do that? <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't do that at all. They had, they had to wash their own shirts. How old was the youngest when your mom passed away? Seven. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. So you really did have to do a lot for them, I'm sure, though. Yeah, I had to do a lot. Yeah. Did you find yourself when the stepmom came into the picture, when she would come to your house, that you would try to keep your dad's attention more? Or would you like sit between them, make it where they couldn't sit beside each other? Now, granted, I know you were a lot older because the mini wife syndrome is usually displayed in those types of actions by coming physically between the stepmom and the dad but you were a little bit older. That might have been weird. <laughs> I, I I actually didn't do that. I know I didn't. I mean, I was 17. So um, I was probably, I was just about to leave home, really. I was, well, I didn't leave home for another year, but I wasn't in that. What I did was, I, I actually just remember feeling very sad. God, I remember that was a sad time. Just really sad, really sad seeing my stepmom come in and take over. And and I remember feeling just pretty desperate. You know, it was just like I just felt I wanted my mum back and 
things were getting wrong with my brothers and mum wasn't there to sort it out and I couldn't sort it out and my stepmom didn't really understand how important it was to sort this stuff out and my mum my stepmom was trying hard but it was just like it just I don't know it all went wrong and it was very hard for me to see it going wrong and my youngest brothers started not doing well at school and I couldn't do anything about that either and I didn't have any you know, nothing. It was awful. Absolutely awful. Mm. I'm so sorry. Sad times. <laughs> yeah. So you moved out a year later. I moved out and went to college. Okay. So you still came home periodically. Yeah. And that was difficult. Mm. Yeah. And I didn't come home. I began to not come home as much as I possibly could. If I could stay away, I would. I did. But I couldn't because I had my youngest brothers. and Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> I'm picturing this happening, that you're leaving to go to college. It's supposed to be an exciting time for you, new adventures. But this lady is having to take care of your brothers. Mm. And that was your role. Mm. Did you feel like you were kind of abandoning them? Yes, absolutely I did. And it's arguably I did abandon them, yeah. I don't think you abandoned them. Mm. I don't think that all. I think that you needed to continue with your life. But you see, it was very difficult for me because I went to college and I was with all these other 19-year-olds. And they were all, you know, going to discos and stuff like that. And, you know, finding boyfriends and girlfriends and, you know, just generally doing what students do. And I was like in a whole different world. I didn't relate to any of that. I was being miserable about having left my brothers at home. Yeah. Then when I did go home, I didn't fit in anymore. And when I went back to college, I didn't fit in anymore. And it was really hard because it couldn't, you know, one of the things about adolescents when they, when they get ready to leave home is they, you know, they've got to strike out on their own and they can best do that when things at home are steady and stable because they've got something to fight against and they come home and their mum or dad is there and, you know, they can have the usual old arguments and then they can say, well, that's how I'm going to go back to college now. And and I, and I everything at home was changing and moving and wasn't the same as it was before and, you know, and it was very unsettling. And then college was very unsettling because unsettling I couldn't settle there either. And it was, it was, it, it, in, and so I didn't have a sort of normal coming out of growing up. I didn't have that normal experience. Right. And so, yeah, I was sort of, I used to go home and I think I was difficult. So I don't think they particularly liked me coming home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they couldn't wait for me to go back to college. And I was miserable at college because I didn't fit in because everybody else was just having a good time and I wasn't having a good time. And, you know, but, you know, Laurie, these things are, we all have times in our life when things, things aren't right. And right. that was the time when it wasn't right for me, you know. Did you finish college? Yeah. Good. I did four years. Hmm. Well, then, you know, I had a long period of sorting myself out. And I did. It was fine. And life got a lot better. And when did your stepmom have a child? When I was 25. So my, my sister's 25 years younger than me. Oh, my goodness. Do y'all have a relationship? Very much so. I really like her. I really like her. I don't have, we, didn't, we don't have our childhoods in common at all. And actually, when she was a child, I didn't see much of her at all because I actually was really lucky and I probably got the the best job in the world and I was I, I I lived and worked in Italy and I traveled the world about two twice a year so I used to go off to sort of Tokyo and Hong Kong and Australia and do all sorts of I really had a really fantastic job and so and that all took place just about the time that yes I was living in Italy age 26 so she was born in when I was 25 so mm-hmm. I was abroad at the time she was growing up. So I didn't really see her much at all at that time. But later, she's now married with children and I'm, you know, we're, we're, we have a good relationship. Good. What about you and your brothers? Yes. 
my brothers, the four of them, uh, the two youngest had a really hard time. Um, and the two eldest finished school okay and went on to further education and are, you know, mm -hmm. they're fine. The two youngest, the scars of what happened to them when my mum died early, it took a long time to they took a long time to recover from so i uh yeah i have a i have a good relationship with my youngest brother but my second youngest brother i have a problem with you have a problem with him as far as what he does as far as his behavior his actions yes yeah yes it's it's he's made some life choices which i find difficult to accept. So I, I've i taken a view. But you don't stop loving him? I do at the moment. Mm. I do at the moment. Really? And that's why um, I think that uh, making step families work is a really important because I think that uh, what uh, I think that you know, it, it, step families are sort of on the periphery of sort of mental health help. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually there are so many step families these days. And step parents can make a huge difference to the quality of life of those children forever. Because children are only, you're only a child once. And that childhood is a really important part of who you're going to be for the rest of your life so much more so than what happens later in life and therefore I think that I'm really committed to trying to help step parents do the right things to help the children cope and grow and have a normal childhood and that didn't happen in my family right and you think that because that didn't happen is why your second youngest brother is struggling yeah. the way he is. Yeah. And it's a shame because we were, it needn't have been like that for us. And um, actually, um, if my stepmother, well, I, I, I mean, why, why should I blame my stepmother? I mean, maybe it was my father and stepmother. But, you know, maybe it was just, Unlucky my mother died. I mean, maybe it was inevitable, but it, it, it it's just I think that, you know, there are things you can do. Bring, bringing up children is, is a very important task, and step-parents play a part in that task. Mm -hmm. And when you well, – the word I like is bonus mum. A bonus parent is a very important part of a child's upbringing – and if the bonus parent can go into that with their eyes wide open and know that it's not the same job as parenting, that is a huge benefit. Because often, you know, things haven't worked out between a husband and wife and they are divorced. But if a bonus parent can, can they can really be just that. They can help the child have the childhood that they need in order to be a responsible, fully grown adult. Right. And that's why when I became a step parent myself, I took it quite seriously. And not seriously in the sense of this is serious. Right. But like I didn't, but I I knew I wanted to enable the children to what I want for them is to grow and have a fully, be fully fledged. Right. Be a, be a whole human being and not suffer from some of these awful things that can happen to you if you're a damaged human being. Right. If that makes any sense. It does. So let's talk about the things that a stepmom coming into a blended relationship should not do. Hmm. And then we'll talk about what she should do. Yeah. So what are a few things that you think a stepmom should not do? A couple of, a couple of things. One of, one of the things I've mentioned already, which is it's very easy to come in as a step parent and spot the things that aren't right. Mm -hmm. And you immediately come up with sort of 
a plan to sort of improve whatever's wrong. Mm -hmm. And my message there is to is to bide your time. Oh, yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong in spotting things that are wrong and seeing that they things would be better if, if they would if they changed. But being a step parent is often about waiting for the opportunity to introduce change rather than insisting on change. Because insisting on change puts the children's back up. But you don't have to wait long to enable change. If you've spotted what needs to happen and are waiting for an opportunity, you can often just sit there and wait for a month or so, and then an opportunity will come up where you can say, well, we could do it this way. And then it'll be, then you get, you get, you get your change, but you haven't initiated change. So you sort of, you're not critical of what's going on at the moment, but you're, that you then come across as forward thinking instead of backward thinking. Yes. Does that make any sense at all? It does. I haven't explained that extremely well. And the other thing associated with that is it's very easy to be critical. It's like eat with your knife and fork, you know, or eat with your mouth shut or <laughs> whatever it is you're, you know, you've got your thing. Or can't you put your, you know, dirty whatever is in the laundry basket, you know, instead of leaving them all over the bathroom floor. It's very easy to to sort of become the step parent and just and just sort of tidy the house up and sort of get things the way they should be. Instead of which, you know, it might be a better idea to, for example, to have a meeting with the child or children or at a mealtime or something. You can say, I just noticed that this family is fantastic at the following things and f name three things that the family are doing really well. You know, like they help each other out or they have a good laugh together or they play well together or whatever you, that is you can think about. And then you can say, well, you know, I'm just wondering whether or not we could also extend that across to being nice to each other at bedtime or when we're trying to leave in the morning we could leave in on time you know or something whatever so you sort of instead of sort of coming in with stuff that's that's negative 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 you could brush your hair better you could you, you know you could be, be ready in the morning for school instead of always making us late you can do this you can do that you can do the other you you, you instead phrase it in a way that's positive so you say look Let's do an experiment. As from next week, let's try and arrive at school on time every day. And in order for that, let's get our stuff ready in the mornings. So we just have everything in the hall ready to, ready to go. And we get up 10 minutes earlier than we did yesterday. And do it proactively instead of being, oh, my God, we're late again. You know, I told you, you know, I've told you yesterday that, you know, we were late and now we're late again. It's all just critical as opposed to positive. So I think that that's one big thing that can happen. And the other thing is to not, not assume your role. So, you know, you can think that you're coming into this family and then you think, ah, oh, you know, I am their father's wife now and therefore I am the mother. I am, I'm going to take a mother role. Mm -hmm. They may not want the mother role. And there is some value in saying, um, look, You've got a mother. I know you've got a mother. What role would you like me to have? And they'll look at you and they'll go, well, I don't really know, really. And they'll say, I say, well, you know, one thing's for certain is that I'm not here to, to you know, to, to, to take your mother's place. Mm -hmm. I want to be the person. I want to be helpful to you. But I don't want you to ever think that, you know, I'm taking your mother's place or whatever it is that, you know, you're or whatever. So so that you're. So you're establishing what they they want as well as what you're wanting. Right. Now, you said that you like the phrase bonus mom. Yeah. I don't really even like the word mom on bonus or step. Yeah. Because that's what sets us up for this, we've got to be the mom crap. Yeah. It's true. Yes. It's true. And maybe you don't want to be the, either a mom or a bonus. Right. Or the kids don't look at you as a bonus or they don't want you around at all. Or, I mean, I understand there are some relationships that the kids and the stepmom have great relationships. I have good relationships or great relationships with a few of my stepkids. Everybody's different, though. And 
I understand that there are a lot of blended families that everything's rainbows and unicorns, but they are few and far between. Absolutely. And I feel, and I have a feeling you feel the same way, that if the stepmom would come in and continue to be dad's partner mm. versus stepmom, step parent, whatever, then they wouldn't have these challenges. It would be easier on the kids, which of course makes it easier and less challenging. But it would also help these kids to not feel afraid or overwhelmed. Yes. Kind of like a mentor. And that's how I look at my role as a stepmom. Yeah, and I, I had a I listened to an interesting, I think it was a podcast recently, about that in fact, you know, you don't expect a, a teacher is not expected to love the kids in their class. Right. No one wants or expects a teacher to love their ste- their children in their class. Right. And why therefore would you expect a stepmother to love their, their stepchildren or indeed set themselves up to be even be the mother role? Mm-hmm. And that's gets that's that sits comfortably, I think, with what you're saying about I just want to be like a, a mentor. Right. And I think when I used the word bonus a little time ago, I think that's how I sort of see see myself not as a sort of mother. But as kind of like a mentor, mm-hmm. you know, mentor, you know, you're sort of there to sort of help out. You're a plus. Right. And therefore a bonus, but not a bonus surrogate mother. Right. More as their parents' supporter. You see, you see what I think is interesting is that it can be a very common error for a stepmom to come into a family, she loves the father, or, and then the expectation is that she, she's going to be fine. She's going to love those kids. And right. the thing is, you are not, you are not destined to love those kids because you're not their biological mother. And right. you, haven't, you haven't bonded with them at birth. There's been no oxytocin, which is that hormone that bonds you. Actually, why should you love your partner's kids. You don't love the the kids in the street who come and play, do you? And you don't love your friend's children. Why would you love? You don't. And then there's a whole expectation that's set up around that. And then you feel disappointed that you don't love them. Right. Then you, then you feel guilty that you don't love them. Mm-hmm. Then you actually feel even worse because you feel quite envious of their relationship with their father and resentful that they even exist. Yes. <laughs> and so then I think that one of the big premises that needs to be addressed is you are not expected and it isn't even normal or natural to love your partner's children. Now, if you started from that premise, then you'd, you'd be much more relaxed about it. And then you could say, OK, well, you know. I don't like the way they do this and I don't like the way that they annoy me around that. And they, and then you can just sort of build in supports for yourself. Right. In the On the understanding that you do not love them. So one of the things I think is important about being in a step family is to de-stress it. Yes. So, so uh, okay, so you've got a, a whole thing going on. Well, one of the things you can do is sit there and organize how your life is going to be. So you structure it so the timing works well and you organize the house so it's, you know, everybody's got enough space to just hang out. So you're not having to listen to what they're listening to when you're trying to do something else. And so you get the irritations down to the absolute minimum. And then when everybody can be a bit more relaxed and nobody's assuming there's something they're not, then the relationships can build and you build those through just mutual trust and respect. If you do stuff you say you're going to do and respect the kids and that's the best you can hope for, then eventually love can grow. But unless you start from a relationship, but unless you start from a sort of understanding that it's not like that to begin with, and you've mm-hmm. got to actually work quite hard at making sure that your life is manageable as it is, 
you'll never get there. Right. And I love that you say de-stress your step family. That is what I feel the Nacho Kids did for me and us. Yeah. Instantly. Instantly, it took the stress off. But you also have to, like you said, work on it. For instance, part of the Nacho Kids method is the stepping back, where you're already in, you messed up, it's time to step back, things aren't going well. The extent of which you do that depends on the person. Yeah. But it never includes, well, you can parent them when it comes to such and such. And the whole thing around the Nacho Kids method is giving the responsibility back to the bio parent. Yeah. You didn't have it to take in the first place. No. Supporting your partner. If your partner needs you to take the kids to school in the morning and they don't cuss you out or try to kill you on the way and you don't mind taking them, then do so. But if it's causing a lot of stress, then something has to change. And if you taking the kids to school stresses you out because it makes you late or they are just hateful youngins and it just gives you a bad morning, then you need to talk to your partner and figure out what your alternative methods are to getting that child transportation. And, but then you've got to go further. You've got to, like you said, how did you phrase it just a second ago? Like limiting the triggers. That's not what you said, but giving everybody the space. And that they need to where you're not just overcrowded and the noise doesn't bother you as much. Do preventative type of things, I guess, because you want to lower those triggers and then you deal with the ones that you can't solve so simply. But it's a lot of self-work. I feel like that going through this blended family stuff Mm -hmm. has... It's definitely been life-changing for me, and I see it be life-changing for other people because what you learn through this process is not something that just applies to your blend. It applies to outside of your blend and your coworkers and the people at Walmart that drive you crazy. I think that um, the you're absolutely right that as a step-parent, you get tested much more than if you weren't a step-parent. All of your insecurities are triggered. Yes. Any kind of comment can be seen as an egg. Like, you know, you can bake a cake and your your stepchild says, well, my mum cooked an even better, you know, cooks delicious cakes. And you see that as a direct comparison. And you think, oh, my goodness, you know, this isn't a good enough cake, Mm -hmm. you know. Or somebody passes comment and says, your body shape or something. And then you you think, oh, you know, but... You're tested in every way by a step family situation whereby everything is comes under scrutiny and you feel inadequate. You know? Yes. You feel, yes. And you've got to you've got to you've got to make yourself whole all the time. Yes. And you don't do that by being miserable. No. You do that by focusing on your marriage, your own kids if you have them. Yeah. And yeah. eventually, believe it or not, if you're struggling in your blend, you will find something eventually that you can say positive about your stepkids. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things about you said you said about, you know, like if you take the children to school and it's driving you mad and, you know, it's up to you, the, 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 the other parent. Mm-hmm. One of the things I, I find that very interesting because one of the things that I found when I became a step parent is that. I was in a situation where my husband worked and he was out of the office all day and and I I couldn't ring him because he was busy right so mm-hmm. I was left in charge of those kids and a lot of the time it was quite hard to do that and you know I did find that resentment built and one of the things I found that I did to counter that was your love I was thinking, I can't, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I um, I called the, ch- the children to a meeting and I said, I knew what it was that I was wanting to change. And we started by talking about things like their food and what f- meals they were all prepared to eat. Because I was like, a, I, was, I was like a short order chef. You know, one of them would want sausages and chips and the other one would want, you know, fish fingers. 
And, you know, whatever. And, you know, and so we talked about the food and we talked about the diaries and what they were going to do and the after school clubs and all the rest of it. And then then I then I then I talked about um, putting in rules that would become house rules. And then I did that by asking them, what am I doing that you'd like me to continue to do? And they told me. And then I said, well, what would you like me to stop doing that I am doing? And they told me. And then I said, what do you, what would you like me to start doing differently? And then they told me. And then I said, well, can I ask the same questions of you? And they went, yeah, okay. So I said, well, look, in answer to the question of what you do that I'd like you to continue doing, I had this little list of things. And I said, I'd like you to continue to do this, what this, that, and the other. And then I said, and what I'd like you to start doing is this and that. And what I'd like you to stop doing is this and that. And I didn't make the list too long, but it worked like a dream because I found a way of managing those children without their father having to be present. Mm -hmm. And we did it. We did it. And then we'd, I'd have that meeting like every we actually did it at the start of every school holiday because I wanted to use the meeting to plan the diary for the, for the holiday. I wanted to do what they wanted to do in the holidays. So make sure that they they had an OK time. And I, if I had a list of things that they wanted to do and see, like they wanted to go to this film and they wanted to meet this friend and they wanted to go go karting or something. I had that list on the first day of the holidays. And the other thing I asked on the first day of the holidays is, do you have any projects to hand in on the first day of next term? <laughs> that was a useful question to ask. <laughs> and I used to plan those holidays according to what they wanted. But at the same time, I used to use them as an opportunity to set up the household so it used to run like I wanted it to. But you did it without being the drill sergeant. You came in being the person that they could talk to about things. And I love the way that you asked them these questions. Well, the thing is, that's what I learned from my stepmother, of course. You learned um, what not to do. Yeah. And yes. that's why, that's why this was so important to me. Yes. And, you know, I am sorry for my, I feel sad about my stepmother, I really do. I feel sad about that situation. But my stepchildren, hopefully, and I must ask them, actually, uh, hopefully they they felt good about the way I asked them things. Right. Now, you've got two stepkids. Yeah. A stepson that's 37, stepdaughter that's 33. Yeah. And then you have two hours kids, both yeah. sons, one's 24 and one's 23. Yeah, and I should certainly say that I started being a stepmother when the, my stepson was eight and my stepdaughter was five. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that puts things into perspective, doesn't it? So, I've so um, yeah, the eldest was eight and the youngest was five, yeah. And where was their bio mom in this picture? Well, she also died. Yeah, she died when, when my youngest was, my youngest stepchild was four. So that's something else you could relate to yeah. with those kids. Yeah. But that's why I know it's really hard for a stepmother because I married my husband. I didn't know his first wife at all. And I was so happy to be married. I was absolutely delirious. I was so happy. My dreams had come true. And it was only the fact that I'd had my experience of my own bereavement with my own mother those many years ago that helped me to see things from my stepchildren's perspective mm -hmm. and knew they weren't probably in the same position as me right. at that time. And I now know that um, how it feels to be bereaved by a partner because now my own husband has died. So, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he died a couple of years ago. So <laughs> it's, um, it's sad. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, you, you must never take life for granted. No, it's part of life, but it sucks. Anytime well, my mom passed away eight years ago and my sister six years ago. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I can phrase it 
is it sucks. Well, you know, the thing is, I think that, you know, you're only given this one life. Mm-hmm. And the main thing is, you know, lots of people say, ah, oh, this step family, you know, I'm, I'm really worse off than other families. This is, a, you know, I can't stand it. I'm having an argument with the ex-wife and, you know, we're having contact disputes. And, with, and the thing is, that I think to myself, this is your life. And it's, you know, the thing is, it's about enjoying the bits that are enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It really and really enjoying those. That's the that's the secret. That's what the hard times teach you. Right. And the thing is, if you're miserable mm. in your life, get help. Mm. Whether it's from you, from me, from Claudette Chenevere, Laura Petherbridge, whoever. Mm. Get help. You don't have to be miserable in your life. Mm. And yes, mm. it's going to take work and it's going to take healing and growth, but all those things are good things. Well, I think actually one of the things that I am most grateful for having become a step parent is that my own personal growth. I would never be the person I am now. You would not be speaking to such a person if I hadn't been a step. I have learned so much. I am so happy. I feel in a way I've done a really long journey in my life and I'm really happy to have had the experiences I've had, both positive and many negatives. Well, as many positives as many negatives, probably. You know, and I wouldn't have it any other way because the growth that step families offer step parents is huge. You're not the same person. You learn so much about yourself. You're yes. so challenged. you're so challenged. It's not an easy environment. And I think I am very grateful to be have had the opportunity of going through it. Because I would not be as content in myself if I hadn't done that journey. And I feel exactly the same. Really? Do yes. you? Yes. Yes. I do have you? I feel like I've aged 120 years, but I also yeah. feel like I've gained the wisdom of 120 years. Wisdom. And, and wisdom is my favorite. It, it happens to be my one of my favorite words. Because as you know, I, I I run something called Be Stepwise. Yes. Yeah. So that so be stepwise comes from be step parent wise, you know, the wisdom that and 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 that's and it's funny, you know. When I was much younger, before my mum died, you know, like when you wish, you you wish for things in your life. I what I wish. One of the things I wanted to be when I grew up was wise, mm-hmm. and I don't think I could have got there without my step parenting journey. So oh. I, and I'm not sure I am wise now. I'm sure I've still got a lot more to learn, but <laughs> progress so far is I'm happy with it. Yes, I have grown so much. Something that would have set me off back in the day, say, for instance, (laughs) the other day I was training the puppies and I had some dog food on the floor. I just sat it there. I didn't see it when I was walking back and I kicked it. This stuff went everywhere. And I'm talking little tiny kibbles. And before I would have gotten mad. Yeah. I would have complained the whole time I cleaned it up. I would have been mad about it probably 20 minutes later. It just would not have been a good situation. I looked at that and I laughed because, first of all, I need to pay attention to where I'm walking. (laughs) Secondly, just the way it went everywhere. It was funny. It, It just kept rolling. And I sometimes I stop and I think I'm here because of this blended family crap. Mm. I had to change how I reacted to things. I couldn't react. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I had to learn to pause. Yeah. I had yeah. to learn that not everybody really cared what I was thinking. That's absolutely right. And one of the things is you've really got to start thinking 
taking the long view, taking the wider picture. What's happening at the moment doesn't matter. Just let stuff go. You know, you've got to pick your battles. All of these things are just good, good stuff. And yes. you, you know, what you're looking for is long term, you want to have great relationships with your family. And if you take the long view as a step parent, when it's when when there's crap, you know, there's stuff on the floor and everything's going wrong, and you don't kick off about that, then ultimately you get to your destination, which is with your end objective in mind. I got a really good a story from a stepmom, and she said she had a new kitchen installed when she married her husband. Oh, no, and, wait till the kids leave. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly right. And she was very precious about this new kitchen because it would cost a fortune, and it was the first time she'd ever had anything like a new kitchen or you know for herself so when the step kids arrived over they you know of course she became obsessive about this kitchen their relationship was destroyed on this kitchen and now she says she and her husband don't see his children anymore and she lives to regret the day she was ever precious about her kitchen and she wishes she wasn't now, that's a very good example of how you can get your priorities distorted. Yes, and I get it. I I want nice things. I enjoy having nice yeah. things. I want them to stay nice. Yeah. In, in fact, I probably have some kind of disorder. Somebody listening might could help me. I don't like to use new things. Yeah. Because if they get hurt, dinged, broke, chipped, what, whatever it may be, stained, it bothers me. Yeah. And I remember several times I've had a new car. I will never own another brand new car again. The stress that comes with having a brand new car and driving on the highway with rocks and whatnot, I don't want to deal with it. I No, no, no. It would have been a real problem for you then. If that's the way you are, you must have really struggled with this. Yes. Yes, I do. And it's interesting, but I realized that that's why I don't want to use new things. Yep. And I also have a habit of I buy multiples. That way I can use one, but I have a backup. Yeah. I think that comes from living out in the boonies. Boonies. I have no idea what the boonies are. I'm, I'm English, but anyway, never mind. Way out in the sticks, way out. Okay. Yeah. Boonies. I yeah. So I was probably 30 minutes from a grocery store, and you mm-hmm. buy multiple things because if you run out of ketchup, you're not going to go grab some at the store. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that's where my little multiple things come in. And I've got this couch. If you've listened to our podcast before, y'all know that I loved my couch. Okay. My couch is a buckskin leather couch that is 25 years old. Yeah. It has been with me the majority of my life. I love my couch. When Jackson was born, well, before Jackson was born, a friend of mine told me, I was so crazy about my couch. She would say, you're going to die and all you're going to have is your Martha Stewart couch. Because I would say, don't drink on the couch. Yeah. Don't don't sit on the couch that way. I yeah. was just really particular about my couch. Yeah. It's like the, this woman in the kitchen. <laughs> yes. When we moved my couch here and David's kids would plop on it, it drove me nuts. We solved that. It's, I don't even think they were intentionally trying to plop. That's just how boys sit. So we got them their own couch. So I had my couch. They had their own couch. I think that's a lovely story of what of what it's all about. Yes. And I know I was reading a story one time, and this lady had got this white couch. After they got married, like you said, mm. all this new stuff, it's great. Yeah. The kid wrote on the back of the couch. No. With a black Sharpie. No. And it was, was a white leather couch. Oh, my God. And I told her... I said, I know this sounds extreme, but you've got to listen to me. I know you're mad. I know you're mad. But if you found out today 
that that child had a terminal illness, would that couch matter? And she said, no. I said, then don't let it matter now. I mean, don't go around promoting them doing it. And I'm not saying you should live in filth or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it's okay if the shoes sit on the floor. It's okay if there's a scratch on your desk from the dog jumping up. It's Mm -hmm. okay that things aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. But please, for the love of Pete, if you are getting ready to get married or move in with your significant other and you're thinking about buying new things, don't. Wait till the stepkids move out. Mm. Mm. And then you can worry about the grandkids doing it. But you'll have a different feeling toward those grandkids. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to really go inside yourself and say, do I want a long-term happy relationship with this child? Or do I want to go to war over a Sharpie on the back of a leather couch? Right. I look at it as emotionally weighing the situations. And I'm not saying you can't be mad or if that happened to your couch, go outside, punch a tree, scream, take five, 10, 15, tw- even 20 minutes, get it out, acknowledge your feelings, but then realize one, there's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. Two, there's nothing you can do about it. I think it's a big one on kind of like what you really, what really matters in life. What yes. really matters in life. Yes. And actually, as you say, with terminal illness, illnesses around and stuff, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's you've just got to keep everything in perspective and realize that there are in the greater scheme of things, it matters about the real, real issues. Right. The, not the stuff we have. Right. But it's tough. it is tough. No, it is tough. I want to ask you, do you have grandkids? Yes. Do you have step grandkids? No, I'm sorry. I have step grandchildren, but not, uh, not. Um, you know, I have step two step child, uh, step grandchildren, but no grandchildren, biological no, grandchildren like, yet. Luck. I'm, I'm counting myself fortunate. My 24, 23 year old, you haven't yet had had children. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have you back as a guest to talk about being a step grandmother. Okay, because that has recently become part of our journey. Hmm. And also, are you a step grandmother? I am. I am a step grandmother to two adorable babies. One is a year and a half, and one is six months. Right, great. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. But I would like to have you back to talk about that and also being a stepmother in law. Oh, yeah. I don't think people talk about that. And I think it's important. Mm. I do want to give you the opportunity to tell people where they can find you. Oh, thank you. So um, my website is www.bestepwise.co.uk, which is bestepwise is spelled B-E-S-T-E-P-W-I-S-E. And I also have a YouTube channel, which the handle for it is at bestepwise. Okay. And I'm looking at your page, and it's awesome. And you've written a few books, correct? I have. I've written, um, I call them sort of booklets. But one of them is that, has that technique about asking the children what they want you to stop doing and start doing and continue to do. So one of them's about that. And then there's another one about um, the, the sort of the, the, the five things that are bet that you need to get over to become a good step parent. Mm-hmm. It's, really, it's really, yeah, it's a good book. But um, yeah, I do. I've I've written booklets. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for being a guest. I really appreciate it. And I do want to have you back on soon because, first of all, I love your accent. Everybody knows I love that accent. (laughs) And I want to talk about some other things. I'm sure that your blend wasn't rainbows and unicorns with your stepkids. So I want to talk about some of the challenges you did have, even though you tried not to be like your stepmom. And then I also want to talk about being a step grandma and a step mother in law, or whatever that it would be. <laughs> That's good. And thank you so much for inviting me on. I All really right. appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye now. Bye. One thing we talked about in this interview was how stepmoms should not come in to find what's wrong. Boom, yow. 
<laughs> but it's so easy. <laughs> it is. Because, David, you were doing a lot wrong. What? Yeah. I tried to come in and find what's wrong so you could fix it. Um, no, it was what you perceived as being wrong. You just admitted that there was a lot of wrong. No, it's what you perceived as being wrong. Oh, so you want to backtrack? There was nothing wrong. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with people jumping on the furniture, running around screaming. <laughs> we had a good old time up in here. Yeah, we did. We also talk about how, as a step parent, you know, the whole love them like your own crap, right? Mm -hmm. But she had a good point that a teacher is not expected to love their students. No. But they can still teach them and discipline them. Mm -hmm. Well, to a degree. Anymore? (laughs) I'm going to say, can they do discipline anymore? Probably not. I'm going to tell I'm going to tell your parents and they're like I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weren't we just talking about that the other day? Uh, I don't know, were we? Yeah. Cuz we were talking about something with but like I'm going to call your parents be like, "Okay, go ahead." Now you're talking to somebody else. Might have been that person in the yard. Might have been. But back in the day, when I was growing up, if they said you're going they're going to call your parents, you were like, "Oh, no, please don't call my mama." Yeah, just give me a paddling. Yeah, <laughs> just beat me within an inch of my life. Do not call my mama. Put me in in-school suspension. hmm Yeah. <laughs> I was always scared of in-school suspension. When I was in school, they put you in, like, this outdoor classroom. Like, we called them mobiles. Put you in an outdoor classroom. It had no windows and one door. I don't need to see how it passed fire code. <laughs> 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 it's like you never knew what went on in there. All you knew was that... Um, you never saw people go in. You never saw people come out. <laughs> yeah. And because they would they um, would make you come in at a different time than normal school. When you left at a different time than normal school. So it's like you got put in school suspension. All I knew is that they were gone from the normal classroom and you never saw them. They had different <laughs> times? Yeah. I- yeah. And they did. You couldn't even go to the to the lunchroom to eat. They had lunch brought in. Like you did not leave that place. <laughs> that no window, one door place. So it was like group then, solitary confinement. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you can call it group solitary. I guess it would be <laughs> group confinement. Um, but yeah, it was crazy. And then, of course, my senior year in school, I got blessed to be part of that group. Because I wanted to see what was inside the room. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You could have just asked for a tour, David. Yeah. Well, it was involuntary, but I digress. Yes, you do digress greatly. (laughs) All right. So since David has digressed, (laughs) we are going to end this. Let's end this thing up because you talk too much. (laughs) (laughs) All right, folks, that's our show for today. Join us next week when you hear us dropping more knowledge bombs. Booyah, booyah, booyah. All right, remember, life is good. When you nacho. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.